Good question. Uh, they're so down this year. It's crazy. Although post uh, stimulus announcement a few days ago, they're on the rise. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Paid chatter, literally. Uh, he's literally a paid chatter. Uh, what about this? No, I'm not bald. <laughs> No, I'm not. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Give him the stream key. Okay, I will. You know what? I will. I'll finally do it. I'll give him the stream key. Uh, I went live for a very specific... I was going to skip today. I'll be honest with you. I slept very poorly last night, and then I played basketball... And now I'm a little eepy. I'm a little eepy bear. Um, did not sleep well. And then didn't mouth tape. That's not why. <laughs> I promise you the reason I slept badly was not because I skipped mouth tape. Uh, aw, baby, didn't get enough sleepy time. Does it have to be like that if I just say I didn't sleep well? <laughs> not a baby thing it's just i didn't i didn't sleep that well it's very normal um classic harder than a nine to five atrioc wanting to skip stream doesn't that make sense this job is harder than a nine to five therefore i have to skip it when i don't get enough sleep because it's it's harder i could easily knock out a quick back-to-back -back double shift at a regular job easily it wouldn't even it wouldn't even break a sweat when i'm this tired but having to go live and watch House will murder me. Um, truck, I have a two-month-old, and I still went to my 9-to-5 today. Yeah, well, I have 1,500 two-months-old I have to entertain. <laughs> okay? So we're not the same. We're not the same. Uh, uh, you take your ivermectin? Of course, every day. Hey, I can't. Bro didn't think about doing a sleep stream and get his stream comfortable sleeping. Now that's a good idea. No, I literally, I, I, um, hard wrote out my schedule, <laughs> uh, of what I want to do at what time every day. I just, I just, cause I was like, dude, I, I got, I'm off schedule now. It's because of that fucking live show. I came back and I've, I've been off. Um, it's how you hold pens. I did it with crayon, <laughs> first of all, and I did it on the fridge. No, I used the fucking whiteboard marker. It's over there. Um, hey, a truck. Uh, I made a song about how great and awesome you are because I figured chat can get too mean sometimes. I hope you like it. I have not even one percent chance. This is what you say it is. <laughs> It's not even 1%, which is crazy. You'd think out of 100 times, one of them would be what you say it is. But you just listen to it, it's kind of sweet. There's zero chance it is what you say it is. I'm, I'm going to click it, but I just know it's called To Gliz a Butterfly. It is an actual song. <laughs> this is not what Kendrick would have wanted. What is this? album art. It's all the chatters and then me holding a coffee. Alright. To Gliz a Butterfly. Can you say happy birthday to my friend Liz? You Liz? Oh shit! Oh. What the hell? Oh my god, no! Yes! Did I do it? No bonus part? I did it? Big A, I went on a date and it was awkward. Say something nice to me so I feel better. It's hard for me, you understand? <laughs> I mean, this is, these examples of me being mean to chat today that's gonna be on the You had to go through five, four years of streaming to find two examples because I'm never mean to chat. I this probably took you fucking forever to scrape. Because I literally am never mean to chat. So it's like you had to like splice together the few off examples. Uh, I am so, so nice to chat. 
to do is when I call that guy a jackass for saying something nice for my six months. <laughs> it's Liz. So sick of Liz. You literally started stream by calling me odd for knowing a song. Yeah, <laughs> because you were freaking me out. Who the fuck knows the first bars of 1997's Cheryl Crow, Tomorrow Never Dies? Psycho? <laughs> uh, fucking odd. Nah, you know what? The best thing about Liz's birthday is that it's one more year to the end. <laughs> this sub ain't free. You looking at me like my channel points in a brick eating a reacts and raw gameplay. This sub ain't free. Living in captivity, waiting for 7.30, telling me the live notification is all I need. Evidently all I see are spam dot cans and poggies. This sub oh, ain't free. Is this Kendrick? Free. I mean, Brandy. You really think <laughs> I'd watch Paper Mario? Don't while call me Brandy. Like you're from Mar-a-Lago. Give her a set to Bezos. Hell fucking no. This sub ain't free. I need VIP and a shout. Out, not 12 months and no people I take subs all the time Patriarch had the door knocking let him in who's that Ludwig's balder friend this sub ain't free pity the fool that made the streamer and you prosper glizzy jokes and business news kept me obnoxious kept me up watching why would, farketing Friday get why would that on make Sundays. you obnoxious you can house with chatters less fortunate than you every man has his day now coffee cow shall moo this sub ain't free matter of fact it needs content matter of fact I just, you know that emote of like uh uh, the pen and it's on fire. Some of you guys posted it. <laughs> he didn't have that at all at any point in this. But I feel like when he said, well, every man has his day, now coffee cow shall moo. I feel like he thought he was... <laughs> I thought, he thought the pen was flames. <laughs> For that bar. But he wasn't. He wasn't. Just to be clear, he wasn't. We can all agree, he wasn't. Shall moo. This sub ain't free. Matter of fact, it needs content. Matter of fact, it needs black myth. Steal my jokes in chat. You're the asshole, bitch. It's been relentless. Fuck forgiveness. Fuck your feelings. Fuck your sources. All distortion. All your titles say maybe tomorrow. It's more band chatters. Abandoned chatters. Waiting for streamers. Left me dormant. Just a doom sagging while you're slurping. Portions of liquid death and sour patch kids. Unfinished games played like four minutes. What a clown. No hitman horseman. Oh, We've got like 40 of them. Sub 12 months and I made you rich. Now my sub ain't we are indeed so bad. You did not make me rich by subbing 12 months. Just to be clear, while I do appreciate the support, that is not, that is not, you've given $35 to Jeff Bezos and $35 to me. Lo-fi bluebird thing to 12. Wow. Really powerful, powerful art there. I think that is what Kendrick was talking about when he said the industry is dead. <laughs> I think when he said the industry is fucking dead, he was talking about that kind of music. Um, you're a prime sub too, huh? So the sub literally is free. <laughs> you're, on your, you're on your parents' Amazon Prime. So it literally is, the sub literally is free. Uh... Interesting. Anyway, any hootie in the blowfish. I came to this stream for one reason. Uh, wait. Dude, I knew the lighting was off. I knew it. I knew the lighting was off. Um, I came to this stream and went live for one fucking reason. And that is while I was in pre-chat... Talking up some shit, chatting up a storm, being the best chatter I've ever seen. Um, somebody said Ijball. Ijball. <laughs> Looks like this. And then someone was like, Yeah, I hate how everyone says Ijball now. And I said, What the fuck is Ijball? And then everyone started making fun of me for not knowing what it is. <laughs> And then I looked into it, and it's fucking real. It's real. It, LOL is out. ROFL is out. Each ball is in. <laughs> what the 
fuck? What the fuck? Oh, dude. What the fuck? This new acronym is replacing LOL and Raffle on social media. What does it mean? It stands for I just burst out laughing. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm looking down. Each bowl, I guess. Uh, Ellie Jackson, a 25-year-old bank analyst, uses Ijbol instead of law because she said it more accurately reflected what happened behind the screen. I'm usually just quiet, and then I let out a snort. <laughs> wow. For Gen Zers, it comes as a timely replacement for a slew of terms that no longer feel fitting. I don't lamau. It's just not what I do. <laughs> Said Michael Messinio, a 27-year-old content creator who lives in Melbourne, Australia. I associate lamau with millennial humor, but I associate Ijbal with Gen Z humor, which is funnier. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. It is functionally no fucking different. <laughs> I don't lamau. That's just not what I do. What a fucking pretentious fuck. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Oh my God. That's crazy. That's crazy. I simply don't lamau. I simply, oh, lamau, that's simply not me. Uh, by the way, he's 27. Bro's fucking on the edge at best. Bro's got one foot in the grave talking like he can't possibly, he couldn't possibly Lamau. <laughs> Bro grew up with VHS tapes, but he couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly Lamau. <laughs> I simply couldn't. I couldn't even type it. I couldn't type Lamau. Shut the fuck up, bro. Shut the fuck up. Oh my God. Uh... My friends were all around the same age, like 18 to early 20s. That's an actual Gen Z, at least. Said Sebastian Champagne. <laughs> <Fuck. laughs> Sebastian Champagne is the fakest fucking name I ever heard. Oh, God. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a fan fiction. It's like a poorly written fan fiction of a rich kid. Uh, a 20-year-old college student who lives in Brockton, Massachusetts. So a lot of us were like, this is going to be our word now. On the internet, Ijbol, which was explored last month by Mashable, has been closely associated with celebrities, including Nicki Minaj, who fell back in her chair with laughter on a live stream. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Do you get associated with it when you fall back in your chair with laughter? Because in that case, I've done it a lot. <laughs> yeah people laugh on stream a lot um and taylor swift who loudly ha ha into a microphone on stage while surrounding by cheering fans with the unofficial face of each ball according to twitter is vice president kamala harris <laughs> of course she is no of course she is of course kamala harris is the unofficial face of each ball. She has a reputation for chuckling unprompted, injecting a levity or nervousness into any situation. Uh, in viral videos posted online, Miss Harris can often be seen doubling over during an interview, almost dropping the microphone in her hand. <laughs> each ball! The unofficial each ball queen. Uh, it got picked up in 2021 among the K-pop fan community who would endearingly categorize their idols according to internet acronyms. Some can be labeled each ball for celebrities who laugh all the time. Others, DPMO, meaning don't piss me off, are celebrities who get angry about everything. Can I somehow be both? <laughs> can I somehow be both? Uh... Yeah, I, fine. This is fine. I'm just shocked. I'm shocked that, uh, you know, I understood when it was get rid of acronyms and go to emoji. I got that. I understand that the skull emoji is a better way to say I'm dead. I'm laughing. This is great. Instead of Lamau. 
I can understand that Lamau's a little bit old school. I get that. But going back to Lamau and making it a five-letter acronym that just means I just burst out laughing, like, that is the same thing. It's actually worse. <laughs> it's actually it's actually worse. Uh, why is this a New York Times article? Uh, I don't know. They got to fill the fucking pages that I'm spending this monthly subscription on. Uh... It's literally better, though. What's better about it? Because it sounds like something that my fucking grandma would type. <laughs> it actually sounds like a very, very early internet acronym where people would just make anything short. Uh, let's see. When Miss Jackson came across each ball last year on Twitter, she thought it was a Korean word. It does sound like a Korean word. Um... Niche corners of the internet like K-pop fandoms can produce spaces of creativity where new lexicons are invented. <laughs> says, <laughs> says a New York Graduate Center professor who studies digital laughter. Bro, that is the most non-sentence. Yeah, of course. Of fucking course. We say glizzy here sometimes. Uh, studies digital laughter. <laughs> I just picture, <laughs> I picture it with like a red cork board and it's got like Lamau, trace to raffle, trace to each ball, trace to <laughs> When outsiders start adopting a colloquial term, the word loses its specificity, and that's when it becomes less fun. You would totally use LOL with your boss. I will say that I have used Lamau with my boss, but, like, that's as far as I escalate, <laughs> said the professor. <laughs> that's why we need to bring new terms into circulation, because you're not going to write to your best friend the same way you're going to write to your boss. Holy fucking Christ. Fine. Why? I don't care. I don't, I don't care. Each ball you want. I, I, it doesn't bother me. Uh, the word would lose its edge and intimacy if, say, Mrs. Harris started using each ball in her campaign. God willing, she does. And then she can kill it. <laughs> God, I'm gonna. I need to. I need to fucking. Send a letter to the DNC. We need each ball to the polls in in a week to fucking end this, to kill it in the womb. Uh, read the next line. Or if the term was written about in a daily newspaper. <laughs> well, there it is. Oh, there it is. Everyone would like lose their minds, then never say it again. Mr. Champagne said. All right. Well, I'm saying it now. Each ball. Each ball. Each ball. Each ball. <laughs> I just broke out laughing. Each ball. There we go. All right. Put that. In, yes. Put that in your fucking pipe and smoke it, Zoomers. Uh, are we sure it is an Onion article? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. Uh... Well, there's a lot of like Gen Z stuff. Are we going to just learn about the New York Times views of Gen Z? Um, here's the thing. Before I move off on this topic, I'm not going to stop lamowing. And I know there's people out there who will ride or die lamow with me. Laughing my ass off. That's a great acronym. <laughs> lamow gets it done. Lamau gets it done, especially a nice all caps Lamau or a lowercase Lamau when you're not really laughing that hard. Lamau gets it done. Uh, the <laughs> the Wokies don't get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
My manager was shocked when the Gen Z developers started blowing up our Zoom tech talks like a Twitch chat. What do you mean by that? Like you're all on Zoom and then you're in the chat of the Zoom and they're just typing like a chat. Yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's a work call. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. <laughs> what are you typing like poggies when someone's? What, are you a, you're putting in ASCII fucking penises? You're cooked. Uh, messaging is so much faster than talking on a call. No, it's not. <laughs> if you're already in the call. <laughs> Some of you are cooked, bro. Some of you are cooked. Uh, PogChamp in the work chat. That's crazy because I worked at Twitch and we didn't do this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? People in Twi at Twitch headquarters didn't do this. Uh... I'm giving my coworkers a solid poggers before. Are you serious? Where do you work? I guess it's fine if you both understand the word poggers. But in public, that's the like in mixed company. I don't if you're messaging a friend or a coworker who like is the same age as you and you go, "Hey, poggers job on that report." <laughs> I don't know if I could stomach it, but like that's fine. But like if you're in an all email and you're like, this was a fucking poggers quarter. <laughs> like that, that seems fucking crazy to me. That seems. I would say thanks. All right. Well, that's good. Hey, I'm in a team's chat with 80 coworkers and some higher ups. I would be caught debt saying poggers. The expression is wouldn't be. So either you missed it or you're trying to tell me that you you do say poggers. Uh, give the CEO a good sheesh. I feel like sheesh you could kind of get away with because sheesh is one of those things that's so self-explanatory. Like if someone had never heard sheesh and then you look at their shoes and go sheesh, they just get that you're complimenting them. Sheesh gets it done. But when you say, wow, that's poggers. <laughs> Nobody, it's like, it's not, that's just not going to work. That's not going to work. Uh, I use worm instead of word. Like when I say, oh, word, I say, oh, worm. <laughs> We're talking about like generational slang here, not the weird fucking thing that you do. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's extremely quirky. Uh, a worm? A worm? Uh. <laughs> uh. Hey, truck over the last two days, I've watched your old house MD VODs incessantly, and I'm already halfway through season four, and it's been really interesting to see the evolution of chat. Um, respectfully, what evolution? <laughs> They've been spamming Glancer, I can't, since since episode one. There's, it, what possible, there's no change. Uh, leggy, hurdy, it's the same jokes. Uh... We contain multitudes. Yeah, I suppose. Um, anyway, let's let's see if there's uh what else do we um how Gen Z made the crossword puzzle their own? <laughs> what are these articles? Legitimately what are these articles? Is there any basis in fact to this? 
A younger generation of constructors is using an old form to reflect their identities, language, and world. And you gotta deal with his feet up on the table with a fucking dozen crosswords. Uh... 31 across TikTok videos of family guy clips accompanied by subway surfers gameplay. I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, sludge content. <laughs> uh, I would say brain rot. Yeah, I would say brain rot, but I guess they've got sludge content. Mm. Don't you play crossword games? Yes. I feel like everybody does. It doesn't feel like it's, um, clues require internet meme literacy. Grids these days are often diaristic. They can re reveal clusters of personal obsessions or glimpses of an idiosyncratic sense of humor. Okay. Wow. Wow. This just feels like a few people who happen to be Gen Z who like crosswords. <laughs> like, is there stats? Is there like a huge groundswell of people? I'm looking for stats. This is such an article. Uh, a to Gen Z crosswords. 72 puzzles that hit different. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy because your book is like a, a chat GPT created 72 crosswords that just happen to say like uh, TikTok in there or whatever. It, 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 it's just a play one. It's a book. I can't. It's going to link me to Amazon, I bet. Can I do one? Yeah, it's, it's a... $13 book. Seventy two puzzles that hit different. Let's see if let me read the uh let me read the reviews. Worth. Well it has six reviews. Uh and one of the reviews is from Richard A, who says, I'm old enough to remember the eighties, but I still love these puzzles. So not exactly hitting its its target audience. Uh, something tells me there isn't a massive groundswell of Gen Z crossword puzzle buyers. Uh, let me let me Gen Z crossword. Looking for a Gen Z. Here, here we go. Okay, here it is. <laughs> okay, Gen Z crossword. Uh, a head in a toilet. Skibbity toilet. Not really Gen Z, but another word for loser. I'm not sure. Three across. Someone who's excellent at getting girls has this. Riz. Riz. A fidget toy enjoyed by young children. Oh. There's a fidget spinner, right? Spin. What the fuck is it? A fidget toy enjoyed by young children. I don't know. Another word for loser. I don't know. Well, you did this crossword doesn't even connect anything. You just have to know the answer. You can't even. <laughs> Uh, a cat that has the song We Live, We Love, We Lie in the background? I certainly don't know that. A very popular game during quarantine. Among Us? Among Us. Sus. Uh, a game from 2017 that came back because the OG map, comma, blank. <laughs> Fortnite. <laughs> uh, someone who has a big behind. Gyat. I don't know this cat, dude. Uh, a fidget toy. I guess this is probably Bozo, right? Bozo. El Bozo. Uh, uh, fidget. No. I don't know. Dude, what the fuck is this? 
A toy enjoyed by young children. I guess. A poppet? A bop it. Bop it. Bop it. No. Um. Va vaping? <laughs> Galaxy gas? <laughs> Not a glape. It's not a crossword at all. It's just a, it might as well be a quiz. <laughs> they, don't, they don't fucking connect. And then what is this? A cat that has the song We Live, We Love, We Lie in the background? Let me just look up that song. I don't even know what that is. We Live, We Love, We Lie. This is something. This isn't the right version. Uh, what do you? This is the ten million view one. Uh, let's see. So that would be. This is our thriller. <laughs> Yeah, that seemed comparable to Thriller. Smurf Cat. Okay, last one's the fidget toy enjoyed by young children. Skibbity. It ends in an I. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just... <laughs> iPad-y. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, whip it. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Answers. Enter the passcode for the Gen Z crossword. <laughs> I got to buy a $9.95 lifetime membership? Bro, just tell me what the answer is. Are you fucking joking? Widget. Is that it? No, it's not widget. Dude, what it? <laughs> I want to Google it. I want to Google it. Okay, I'm going to Google it. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to Google it. Is it? What is it? What worm it? Pop it? Oh, it might be pop it. It's pop it. It's literally pop it. What the fuck is pop it? Pop it is a fidget toy that broke blew up after appearing in a TikTok video. After being shown in a viral TikTok video featuring a monkey. <laughs> wait, wait. Now I got to see it. <laughs> How a monkey launched the poppet toy craze. Wait, where's the original video? That this is fucking wild. Ah! Ah! The assumption are of sales between 500 million to a billion copies. <laughs> What the fuck? Oh my god, I gotta watch this Mon monkey pop it video. Okay, this is the one. This video made <laughs> billions. Cinema. <laughs> That's fucking it. That's fucking it, bro. Uh, you have to admit that's pretty sick. Yeah, it's fine. I mean... <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. I, it's kind of based on the monkeys having a good time. I'm just shocked that that video had such an impact. Uh, we need to keep that in mind for when we do the pop a thon. We need that video to pop up on screen. Uh, that's something. I, have I learned anything yet <laughs> about <laughs> what have I what have I learned here? I'm not a hundred percent certain. Um. Uh, Gen Z is taking back Facebook in order to save money on Facebook Marketplace. For a generation that loves thrift shopping, Facebook isn't a place to socialize online. It's the best place to score some deals. Oh, wait, Facebook Marketplace, though? Yeah, Facebook Marketplace. Uh... I only use Facebook for Marketplace. Interesting. Is it better than eBay? I, I don't really use Facebook Marketplace. Uh, is it better than Craigslist? Is Craigslist somehow boomer? <laughs> And Facebook has become Zoomer. Uh, Craigslist is weirdo. Craigslist is dead. Interesting. Uh, young people, including students and young professionals, are increasingly drawn to used goods because they're environmentally conscious. Uh, I think it's got to be more because they don't have the money. Um, damn, they got a West Elm couch for $145? Wait, that's fucking sick. That's a sheesh moment. Wait, I want to look at Facebook Marketplace, but I don't want to dox myself. Uh, Facebook Marketplace stream where we try to trade up something to, <laughs> to get the maximum amount of... <laughs> Holy shit! I went on Facebook Marketplace. There's nothing doxing here. I can get a 2011 Rolls Royce Ghost for only $98,000. Holy shit, a ghost? Roly poly rolling up in the ghost? How about that, dude? Uh, that sounds badass. Wait, where else can I? Dude, I see. Wait, there's some shit on here. Wait a minute. There's some shit on here. Dude, so wait. <laughs> um, there's a foot massager for only eighty five, down from one fifty. There's a. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> there's a used Halloween costume for infant. <laughs> It's a child's penguin costume for $10. That doesn't seem like a good investment. Uh, a lot of cars. Surprising amount of cars. Kind of a way to skip a dealership. Wow, the entire Diary of a Wimpy Kid collection. Look at this. For only 50 bucks? Books 1 through 13? buy it i'll leave it for you guys feels like it's right up <laughs> cop immediately uh that shit that shit's wild all right well i didn't know facebook marketplace was bumping like that 
I might need to check it out. There could be some good shit in there. What else? What else is... Uh, many of Harvard's Generation Z... This is Gen Z at elite colleges. They say sellout is no longer an insult. I, I, I already, I've said this on the stream. I think I've said this for a long time. I don't think that's new. I feel like sellout hasn't been an insult since like low key the 90s. Um, nowadays, it's almost like if you don't sell out, yeah, people are like, why weren't you offered? <laughs> why didn't you get the chance? Uh, I remember thinking this when I went to the, I went to the black pink concert. I'm not like a huge K-pop person, but I got an opportunity to go with friends to black pink. I went to their first American concert, uh, for black pink. And it was the most <laughs> in a good way, I guess. Now it is. It was the most sellout concert I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> In my entire life, like it was filled to the brim with ads, including at one point in the middle where they paused the show to play a full five minute car commercial <laughs> with them in it where they're like driving Kias around a parking garage. Um, shit was wild. And, and but everyone's losing their mind. They're losing their mind. And uh and it's just so different. Like, can you imagine, like, um, I don't know, the Rolling Stones or something back in the day? <laughs> like, <laughs> back when sellout was a thing? It's crazy. Uh, anyway, what else do they say here? The meme was an image of a head with I need to get rich slapped across it. Freshman after spending .02 seconds on campus, read the caption. Okay, so freshmen get on campus and they want to get rich. Yeah, I mean, that isn't, that's not that crazy. People want money. Um, Despite the popular image of this generation, that of Greta Thunberg and the Parkland activists, as one driven by idealism, Gen Z students at these schools appear to be strikingly corporate-minded. Even when they arrive at college wanting something very different, an increasing number of students at elite universities seek the imprimatur of employment by a powerful firm and making a bag as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, I don't think that's that different. I honestly think this is like, I don't know. Like, you go, you go back to the 80s and Harvard students didn't want to make a bag. <laughs> They've always wanted to make a bag. They've always worked at Goldman Sachs. What's the difference? Uh, oh, actually, they answer my question. They've always been major feeders into finance and consulting, and students have always wanted to make money. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the biggest increase in students wanting to become well-off financially happened between the 1970s and 80s, and it's been creeping up ever since then. Wow. Isn't that strange? Ever since 1971. Hmm, much like everything else. <laughs> but in the last five years, faculty and administrators say the pull of these industries has become supercharged. That's not the year I was born. <laughs> in an age of astronomical housing costs, high tuition and inequality, students and their parents increasingly see college as a mean to lucrative job. Bro, not even lucrative. People see college as a means to a job. <laughs> <laughs> They're just trying to find a an employment uh, more than a place to explore. A herd mentality. Uh, at Harvard, a graduating senior who passed on a full scholarship to another school told me he felt immense pressure to show his parents that their $400,000 investment into Harvard would allow him to get the sort of job where he could make a million dollars a year. Jesus Christ. A million dollars a year out of college? Also, 400K tuition. Jesus. Uh, that's so little. <laughs> like, everyone in my chat makes more than this. 
only a million and you're in Harvard? Fucking broke ass. Oh, so he's going to work at Blackstone. <laughs> he's going to work at private equity firm Blackstone, where he believes he will learn and achieve more in six years than in 30 years in a public service oriented organization. It's funny. Learn and achieve. Should just, I'll just replace this. Uh, inspect. Let's just be honest. <laughs> uh, wait, no, I fucking can't close this. Oh, dude, where's my where, F11? F11. Uh, what else? There's definitely a herd mentality. If you're not doing finance or tech, it can feel like you're doing something wrong. Hmm. Sometimes someone else told me it was common at parties to hear people, hear their peers say they just want to sell out. <laughs> what they learn at Harvard, he said, is that actually doing anything meaningful is too hard. <laughs> Wait, everyone arrived on campus hoping to change the world. But what they learned at Harvard is that actually doing anything meaningful is too hard. <laughs> <laughs> people give up on their dreams and decide they might as well make money that's so funny because i'm not even necessarily disagreeing it's very hard to make a meaningful impact on the world and also in general you know you generally have to get your own shit right before you can help others it's very difficult to to help someone before you've got some sort of stability of your own but it's so funny to do this while you're still a student at harvard you're one of the most privileged people in the world. <laughs> like, you have yet to graduate. And when you do, you're going to have more opportunities. It's insane to be like, oh, it's art. This is too difficult. Uh, that's, that's such an early time to give up. Between freshman and sophomore year, you decided, ah, eh, it's already over. As a freshman, he planned to major in environmental engineering. As a sophomore, he switched to economics, joining five of his six roommates. That's what we need. Five more economists. <laughs> five more Harvard economists who are never wrong. Uh, once those roommates told me, one of those roommates told me he had to run a hedge fund. He hoped to run a hedge fund by the time he's in his 30s. <laughs> Dreaming big. God, I can't wait to run a hedge fund by the time I'm in my 30s. Before that, he wanted to earn a good salary, which he defined as $500,000 a year. Yeah, just something stable. Something. <laughs> okay, uh, listen, I know Harvard is an excellent school. Don't get me wrong. Uh, average Harvard graduating salary. The median starting salary for Harvard graduates is between 70K and 90K. That's what I thought, dude. That's what I fucking thought. This dude's talking about fucking $500,000 out of college. According to a Harvard Crimson survey of Harvard seniors, the share of 2024 graduates going into finance and consulting is 34%. That's so disgusting. <laughs> I feel like consulting is one of the biggest wastes of talent that our country has. And if all of our, you know, brightest young minds are going into fucking McKinsey, ugh. Just to understand, the role of somebody working at a consulting firm like McKinsey is to essentially make PowerPoints 
for people that own real businesses to make it okay for them to do layoffs. <laughs> like, like in practice, that is what you actually do is you make a PowerPoint that says you have to cut costs. And then the CEO that hired your consulting firm can be like, look, it's not my fault. The consulting firm said it. And then they can do the layoffs without feeling bad. That is, that is the purpose of those jobs. Most consulting firms are hired to do something that the CEO already wants to do and needs justification. So it, it's such a colossal waste of, I mean, it's highly paid. It's very highly paid, but, um, Jimmy Beast says to always use consultants. Jimmy Beast is talking about if you're getting a hot air balloon, get a hot air balloon consultant. <laughs> He's not talking about hire a management consultant so you could lay off factory workers. Uh, although I will, I will say this. Wait, I got one thing. So I recommended that uh, Mr. Beast document or whatever. Where is it? Where's the production HR document? Uh... I recommended it, and I do think it's a good read. I think, uh, you know, I recommend people who are motivated young people to give it a read. I think he he wrote it in, like, 2021. It was before everything even happened. Um, but there was one part that uh, someone linked me that I'd forgotten about that I thought was very funny, and it was – let me see if I can find it. Um, where is it? it may, this one right here. Understand culture. <laughs> Okay, what you consume on social media, when you watch YouTube, TV, the games you play, are what I call your information diet. Chris Tyson, our first subscriber and the guy in the videos, again, this is 2021, uh, before Ava, is a wonderful example of an information diet being used to perfection. The dude is funny as fuck. I've never met anyone in my entire life that can make people laugh like he can, and I never understood why he was so good at it until I lived with him for a few years. This is, this is this key. I'm, again, this is not about controversy. I'm just talking about 2021, Chris Tyson. This is why Mr. Beast thinks he's so funny. The dude watches an obscene amount of cartoons and stupid shit. <laughs> His eyeballs exist to inhale copious amounts of dumb, goofy, brain-numbing content. As a result, he can quote almost any line from any episode of SpongeBob. <laughs> He's able to draw from so much stupid shit in his head as inspiration to make jokes and be quirky. And as a result, he is fucking hilarious. But let's imagine a different Chris. Let's say instead of cartoons and stupid shit, his information diet was stocks and investing advice. <laughs> and for five years, that's all he consumed. Do you think he'd be just as funny as he currently is? No. In my opinion, he wouldn't even be 20% as funny. Fuck, dude. I'm never getting hired. I'll never get to be talent. Fuck, all I do is read investing in stock books. <laughs> this is an AI article for sure. Bro, this was written by hand by Mr. Beast in 2021, fucking two years before ChatGPT. You are cooked. Uh, anyway, I've decided I will no longer read Financial Times every morning. I am instead going to watch SpongeBob start to finish. Uh, that way I will be way funnier. Way funnier. Uh, is mayonnaise an instrument? <laughs> Dude, it's off the top of my dome. Just like, just fucking... Bzz, 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 bzz. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, what else does this say? These statistics approach the previous highs in 2007, after which the global financial crisis drove down the share to a recent low of 20% in 2009. Oh, I see. So the number of uh, elite university graduates um, going into consulting gets higher and higher and higher until a recession. And we are approaching the previous high. <laughs> that's, very, <laughs> that's, that's 
<laughs> very loose. Uh... Uh, have you seen the crazy stuff Jennifer Aniston is saying about NVIDIA on Twitter? I, I can't tell if you're joking. Have I seen the crazy stuff that Jennifer Aniston is saying about NVIDIA? Jennifer Aniston from Friends. I don't see anything. There's nothing. I was lying. Get fucked. I made that up. <laughs> oh, you're banned. Get fucked. <laughs> and I'm not making it up. <laughs> How about that? How about that, bro? Fucking 600 messages. How about that? <laughs> uh, what else? Aiden Barton, seen here, said that selling out was more of a descriptive phase than a judgmental phrase than a judgmental one. I, I'm not surprised to see you sell out. <laughs> wow, you're telling me this guy's not going to work for Greenpeace? I'm sh I'm shocked. I'm fucking shocked. When I saw this guy, I thought for sure he'd be on the front lines. I thought he'd be saving the fucking whales. This guy's going to work in finance or consulting? You're lying. Let's see. David Halleck, director of employer relations at Yale's Office of Career Strategy, thinks term, students may use the term sellout because of the perceived certainty. It's the easy path to follow. It's well-defined. Um, yeah, maybe they're actually just looking. Like The idea is if you say that I'm selling out enough, then you're guaranteed to get a good job. <laughs> if you say I'm selling out, well, then I guess I'm guaranteed to get the high-paying job that's not moral. No, I don't think so. There's no guarantee, bro. You might, not, you might just say you're selling out and then not getting it. Um, it's like it's happened a lot when I was uh, working in Silicon Valley where people would, um, they would make money like from a stock vest or something and then they wouldn't want to work anymore. So they'd either quit or quiet quit or whatever, knowing that they weren't going to get promoted, probably going to get fired or let go or put on a pip or, or just not have a job. And they were always like, yeah, you know, whatever. If I ever need money, I'll just sell out and work for Facebook. I'm not kidding. A lot of people told me this. <laughs> a lot of people told me, yeah, you know, if I, ever, if I ever need to actually figure it out or like ever want to start getting a house, I'll just sell out and work for Facebook. And it's like, I always thought this, but I, you know, I was a lot younger. So I was like, all right. It's like, what if you just don't get the job? <laughs> what if Facebook just doesn't hire you? They all said it like it was just like, tap it in. Yeah, I could just make 250K minimum. I go work at Facebook and it's like maybe in 2021 or maybe in um, 2014 you could, but uh, I think that's so different now. They're certainly not hiring like they were. Um, some students talk about turning to a different career later on after they've made enough money. Nowadays, English concentrators often say they're going into finance or management consulting for a couple of years before writing their novel. <laughs> that, that's the novel I want to read. A person with no life experience who did three years as a management consultant. <laughs> Pour your soul out on the page, young blood. Let me fucking, let me hear... <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley in the 2010 sounds made up. It was a good time. Silicon Valley in like 2014 was just, I mean, that's like peak ZERP, zero interest rate. Every startup gets funded. People were 
getting insane pay packages. Um. Uh, Twenty fourteen was crazy. Um, a surprising number of students explain their desire for a corporate job by drawing on the ethos of effective altruism. Oh, the fucking Sam Bankman Freed. They believe they can have a greater impact by maximizing earnings to donate to a cause rather than working for that cause. Well, to be honest, that's probably true. Um, it's just whether or not they end up actually donating. Um, do you think we'll ever get back to insane pay packages in tech ever in all time? Sure. I don't know. Everything ebbs and flows, but in the short to medium term, no, no, it's like, it's like a winter right now. Uh, I mean, you could still get an insane pay package right now. If you're like an AI expert, if you studied AI in college, you could probably, in an internship, you probably get paid big. But everything else. Um, but once students board the prestige escalator and become accustomed to a certain salary, walking away can feel funny, like walking off an escalator. True. Um... The change is striking to those who have been in academia for years. This, this teacher first noticed a change around 2015 with students who had been in high school during the Great Recession and who were therefore prioritized financial security. The students saw what their parents went through and the parents saw what happened to themselves. Uh, as college tuition started to rise, people started looking for monetary payoffs right after graduation. I mean, that's a big part of it, too. It's like if you have a fucking big-ass student loan and then you graduate and you have like a six-month grace period, then it's like you got to start fucking paying. You need a job. Um, this reminds me of Jimmy Carter. How? How does that remind you of Jimmy Carter? Um... 20 years ago, an introduction to investment banking event was held at the undergraduate library at Harvard. 40 students showed up, all men, and when asked to define investment banking, none of them raised their hands. <laughs> now, according to Goldman Sachs, the banks had six times as many applicants this year as it did 10 years ago. That's funny. I'm glad we have more investment bankers. That's good. That's good. Oh, there's actually a... There's a new... Dan Toomey, I wanted to watch. Um, I don't know if there's anything else from this fucking article that I wanted to read. Oh, what is this? In recent years, he's observed two trends among students pursuing wealth. There's the option buyer, the student who takes a job in finance or consulting to keep more options open. Then there's what he calls the lottery ticket buyer. The students who go all in on a risky venture like a startup or a new tech, hoping to make a windfall. They know people who bought Bitcoin at 2000. They know people who bought Tesla at 20. <laughs> Gamblers, okay. Uh, all of this logic goes, make the bag so you can do good in the world. Make the bag so you can go to retirement. Make the bag so you can then go do what you really want to do. But this really underestimates how important work is to people's lives. What it gets wrong is you spend 15 years at the hedge fund, you're going to be a different person. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, that is true. That is true, bro. You put in 15 years at a fucking hedge fund. Uh, you're going to be a hedge fund guy. You just You will be. But that's 15 years anywhere. Still, I can't I can't uh, judge too much. Like you know, people want financial security in a in a world that prioritizes money over and over. I don't think it's that crazy, but it just it sucks that so many talented people go into consulting and hedge funds and investment banking. It feels like a waste of their talents. Um. Mm 
They should go into consecration. That's what I'm talking about. That is, that's, I think they should become kick streamers. That's where like the real best and the brightest are showing how they can help the world. Um, what about this? In a first among Christians, young men are now more religious than young women? Interesting. Among us? A worm? <laughs> We've been talking about it from the beginning, said Phil Barnes. What's the Lord doing? Why is he sending us all these young men? 12 of the 16 young people then were men. Interesting. I mean, it probably lines up with what we were, we were talking about earlier on that previous video where it's like men are... This might not even be such a bad thing, to be honest. This is probably better than the alternatives. Men are just looking for a connection, dude. They're looking for a third place, looking for a group, for bonding. Uh... Sausage party on a Sunday. <laughs> Walking into a church on Sunday, looking around, seeing it's all men. Sausage party. <laughs> oh, dude, this is so unrelated, but I need to talk to chat. Is, is, uh, wait. Um, I need to talk to chat. This is serious. Okay? This is serious. Uh, wait, let me turn on the air. Damn it, Tom. Okay, this is what I need to talk about. Uh, and I am mad. <laughs> this is serious and I am mad, though it's probably not chatters. Uh, we uploaded a video on the Clips channel called The World's Worst Honeymoon yesterday. And it was about um, Linkus leaving Maisie and Coach while he flew first class or whatever. And it was funny, okay? And in the video, it's Linkus and Maisie calling in and laughing and joking and Linkus leaning into it. And it's funny. And the top comments are all great. You couldn't waterboard this out of me. You know, uh, Linkus, Lamau, whatever. And then the comments started to get really fucking mean to a brand new newlywed couple of my friends who I love. Okay. They started talking about like, oh, by the way. This is a bunch of unmarried YouTube commenters armchair psychologically analyzing how the fuck Linkus and his fucking wife are going to get divorced based on this funny joke they shared with me voluntarily. Fucking Reddit counselors. I almost deleted the video. I was so mad. It was so many fucking idiots. Like, they cannot see how weird and antisocial they sound like they're the fucking expert i was just at their wedding it was the most beautiful wedding okay you think when Maisie was reading her vows choking up crying and looking into his eyes they were thinking about fucking uh the stupid time about coach like it was such a funny little moment and then people uh ruined it in the comments i thought it was so cringe dude i thought it was so incredibly cringe um and i felt bad for linkus because like what if he you know like i don't know it's just annoying um his money his rules honestly if he's gonna act like that the relationship's never gonna last dude you have no fucking idea 
what their relationship is going to do. You fucking psycho. You are a psycho. Your brain is not wired correctly. You can literally hear her laughing in the background as he's telling the story. He's leaning into it. Oh, I'm so m mad. I'm so mad. He's making fun of them? Better be. I'm going to check his chat history. <laughs> uh, these are... Anyway, just because I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Because I, I don't like... Because... Here's why. Here's cuz. I don't want them in my community. <laughs> That's why. Here's why. Is I don't want them in my community. Okay? So when I put a video like that and we're all having a good time and enjoying it, I don't want them in my comments being like, oh, let me volunteer this information as a part of the Big A Clips viewing audience. I don't go watch someone else. Okay? I don't mind it. Making fun of Linkus was the goal. Okay? Writing a fucking paragraph about how, um, actually, this marriage is doomed to fail. I give him six months tops because I understand. You're fucking weird. It's such a weird thing to do. Think about it for two fucking seconds. Um, so that's why I'm mad, okay? And I have to do this every now and then to make sure that I fucking put my foot down and set standards. Otherwise, chat creeps into these fucking areas that they shouldn't be in. And I get the wrong kind of people. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say that. Because it actually bothered me. Because I thought about... I, yeah, I just like... It's such a... You know, it's like almost mean of me to have it up. Because nobody wants to hear annoying comments about their fucking marriage. Uh, and it, what's also extra annoying is like... Linkus, clearly... If you have any ounce of a brain... Leaned into the bit. He leaned into it for our entertainment and our benefit. And now he's like incentivized to be like, um, actually, no, I would never do that. And like, whatever. He's like to, to fucking say the most boring shit. Cause he has, it's just, ugh, it's so, it's, I just, some people are <laughs> beyond saving, bro. I can't, uh, Anyway, uh, their marriage, much like China, has 30 days left. <laughs> Bro, and if I, oh my God, I'm getting triggered today. Bro, Wombo Bongo, I'm sure you're a nice person. If I have to hear one more person tell me to check out Stephanie Kelton, I have read her book back to front. It is a snake oil salesman of shit. It is dog shit. MMT is so fucking stupid. It was created around 2020, okay, when we needed someone to tell us it was okay to just print infinite money and hand wave away all the negative effects. Thank God nobody fucking talks about it after 2021 and we got massive inflation, which they barely discuss in the book. It's so annoying. 90% of the book is talking about how easy it is to print money, no downsides, even though it's been the downfall of like every fucking civilization in the past. And then... At the in like tiny paragraph footnotes, she's like, ah, by the way, if we ever do print too much money, we'll know because we'll get inflation. But what we do then is really easy. We just raise taxes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Fucking two sentences on raising taxes? Yeah, it's fucking easy, I'm sure. I'm sure it's so much easy for a political party to print money to buy things that everyone wants than it is to get them to raise taxes. MT was different on before 2020. MT's been around for a while. I mean the fucking Stephanie Kelton book that made it mainstream and the fucking endorsement. Uh, it's uh, it's horseshit, bro. It's MT is horseshit. So I just wanted to put that. Out. I'm so, I'm tired of getting recommended it. Like I haven't fucking read it. I read I read every word of it. <laughs> uh, it's very neatly packaged. It's like a very it's like a used car salesman. Um, yo, big guys, you see what Jennifer Aniston said about inflation? <laughs> nice callback. 
Nice callback. Nice callback. Nice callback. Nice callback. Nice callback. And that's the end of the clip, folks. And I'm going to end stream. <laughs> That's the end of the clip. We formed a clip for today. That's the end of the clip. I'm going to end stream. I have uh, a lot of stuff to do. I have a lot of stuff to do. I just wanted to go live and talk about each ball. Um, so thanks for what? Unless I'll play a league game if anyone's around. Wait, is anyone around to play? Is like Stanzi? Nah, he's not. Oh wait, I got no. Nah, I got I got messages. I got messages. Uh, I got shit to do. <laughs> Raid Linkus is he live? twitchtv slash Linkus seven. Oh, we can watch the Good Work video. Oh, right, let's, let's watch the Good Work video. We'll watch the Good Work video and then we'll raid Linkus. That sounds good. What do Wall Street quants actually do? What do they actually do? Good question. Quants. Short for quantitative, they're a special type of nerd that has come to invade our beautiful world of finance. I've always imagined the classic Wall Street trader to be your typical handsome fella who knows how to handle the cross stick in a non-disclosure agreement. But lately it's come to my attention that the real wolves of Wall Street are not charismatic Buck Mason bros, but instead this army of reclusive dweebs who are pulling in fat salaries and wrestling with complex mathematical algorithms that would make my old buddy He's on the trading floor commits seppuku inside of a just salad. Learning about quants, folks, has truly turned my world upside down. So put on your sweatpants, pick up your calculators, and leave those boat shoes in the mudroom. We're about to learn. All right! All right! Today, quantitative strategies are incorporated across the financial industry. But when people say quant, they're probably referring to the most famous types, traders and researchers at fancy hedge funds and investment firms like Jane Street, Citadel, and Two Sigma. These quants use financial Two models Sigma? to try to pin down- Holy shit. Jane Street, Citadel, and Two Sigma. Jane Street of Sam Bankman Freed fame. Uh, wow. Two Sigma. <laughs> what a dream to be a Gen Z finance bro who graduates and works at Two Sigma. <laughs> Where you can fucking upper deck Zins while making mathematical algorithms to fucking buy zero day NVIDIA options. These quants use financial models to try to pin down the future value of securities, commodities, currencies, and all types of financial products. And it's a job usually given to young people fresh out of top tier schools and seasoned from years of math competitions in Adderall. And it's these peeps who generate a lot of moolah and a lot of buzz. What exactly is a quant? What's a quant? The pinnacle of finance. They get paid a lot, like $500,000. $250 an hour. Five to 700K total comp. How do I become a quant? That's my quant. Your what? My quantitative. <laughs> my math specialist. Look at him. You notice anything different about him? So who exactly are the people <laughs> behind the monitors? I spoke to some smarties who have been inside the world of quant in various ways, some of whom preferred to stay anonymous, but none of whom were afraid to give it to Papa Journalism fast and straight. <laughs> what do away. quants <laughs> actually do? Right. Uh... <laughs> Code and do maths. <laughs> Well, great. This has been a lovely interview. <laughs> a lot of math and a lot of computer science. As a quant, a signal in the market is just anything that can happen that we think is predictive of something else. The signals that quants excel at are things that your average banker would never in a million years notice. Things that are buried into the math. Stuff you can only find with big amounts of data analysis and 
machine learning. There's huge amounts of research on being able to predict the weather in like Nebraska five days from now because if we figure out that it's going to be three degrees hotter than it actually like the weather forecast predicts, then we know that a pipeline that's carrying oil from the northeast to Texas going through Nebraska might cost an extra 10 micro cents per liter so we can, <laughs> you know, adjust those markets ever so slightly. I obviously had no idea what he was talking about. So to learn more about how the hell bookworm freaks like him ended up in finance, I had to go back to the beginning, which for quants means the renaissance. Technologies. Renaissance Technologies, a the leader goats. of the quant trading movement and founded in yeah, 1982, they are the Renaissance Technologies is a trading firm who embraced algorithms years before everything else in the world embraced algorithms. Renaissance's king dork was Jim Simons, one of the few early math. I feel like they have had the best performance of any hedge fund over like 30 years. I think they they compounded it like. Oh, he's about to say that? Okay. Mathematicians who brought their talents from the halls of academia to Wall Street in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, so he's uh, a pioneer. I wouldn't say he's the pioneer, the only pioneers among the pioneers of this quantitative push. Gregory Zuckerman is an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal and author of The Man Who Solved the Market, a biography of Jim Simons. If he had only done mathematics, he'd be worthy of, of a book and all kinds of uh, recognition. And he gave it all up. Uh, to go into to trading and invest in his firm. It's called Renaissance Technology. He gave up being mildly known as a mathematician to be one of the richest men in human history. <laughs> Saying he gave it all up implies that like it was a noble sacrifice. That's, uh, that's not brave. That's the other way around, if anything. And the key hedge fund, Medallion, he is sold the out, greatest yeah. money-making entity Wall Street's ever seen. Their average returns are 66% a year over many, many sure. decades. For context, sure. averaging 66% in returns is literally better than any investor you've ever heard of. Warren Buffett, Ray Dalio, Wilmer Guffins, George Soros. Literally none of these guys even came... Dude, remind me about Ray Dalio when I'm doing marketing tomorrow or something i i have a lot to say about ray dalio but i don't want to do it today remind me <laughs> i got a paint rant close to that number not even the one i made up but why then isn't slim jim as big of a name as these guys he was very secretive he didn't want the acclaim if anything he avoided it um it was a really difficult project to, to, to write this book people weren't allowed to talk to me uh they're not allowed to talk in general they have these really thick NDAs. And it turns out the secrecy that defined Renaissance is actually quite characteristic of the quant industry in general. They're worried someone's gonna pick up on some of their secrets. They, they, they don't let people talk and they sue sue you if, if you go to another firm. So if you're, you know, going on yapping about, you know, <laughs> this wacky new trading strategy you found, they're gonna go implement it at their firm and you're gonna lose all your edge because you can't have edge in the market when everyone knows what you know. All of the value is to be had in being the only one that knows what's going on in that specific scenario. Fortunately for these firms, under the radar My is edge. how their mathletes like to operate. These are academics. These are kind of quirky people. They're not people that bask in the limelight at all. They, they run from the limelight. So, so I enjoyed solving maths as a kid. I used to enjoy the process of being able to apply some solution and get some exact answer and know that it was correct. I enjoyed having to think about kind of work out the puzzle and i think after a while you can kind of get addicted to that feeling of trying to solve these problems they're not really motivated as much by money even though money is certainly a part of it you know these are people who just want to solve basically interesting problems but i think it's a completely different motivator in some ways than other parts of the banking uh, world right i mean i'm sure the salary doesn't yeah i was doesn't, gonna say doesn't hurt either <laughs> right 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 but even if these basement lurking money droids don't seek the limelight the limelight has certainly found them. By 2017, quantitative funds accounted for over a quarter of all U.S. stock market trading. And unlike the Ivy League acapella wars of 2013, I'm not the first one to report on this. <laughs> Quants becoming a central player in finance is bold news. But as the amount of the market that we're putting into the hands of computers continues to grow, and as computers become more powerful, <laughs> fear around algorithmic doomsday scenarios grows as well. Today, parts of these advanced programs are so-called black boxes, meaning 
We don't always know why algorithms recommend certain trades. Also, people are worried about fun stuff like AI going off the rails and making rogue buy and sell decisions. And then there's stuff that's already happened. For example, in August 2007, billions of dollars evaporated from the largest hedge funds after an algorithmic fire sale. Or maybe you look at what happened in 2010 when an automated trading software rapidly sold a shit ton of futures contracts to do with the S&P 500 and erased $1 trillion in market value. I remember that day well. Before dawn, I was lying in bed next to my second wife, my eyes wide open, peering over a field of frosted grass outside of our window. And I said, honey, I don't know what it is, but I feel like $1 trillion <laughs> in market value will be erased from the S&P 500 LeBron? today. Direct and LeBron said, quote. Hush, Dan. I'm dreaming of a man who can make me climax. <laughs> you know, we stayed together for three years after that. But in that moment, I knew the relationship <laughs> was over. It's sort of like the boogeyman today where everybody, <laughs> you can't figure out why the market moved, so it's got to be the quants. That's sort of like the instinctive explanation. And I think it's a little bit unfair. I don't think they're foolproof. I don't think they're necessarily so much better than everybody else. But um, we, we've had panics throughout history um, in financial markets. So sure. we'll have some computer-oriented panics, uh, um, downturns uh, in the future, but we've had them in the past as well. So then can I ask, what's your read on the quant industry today? Have most hedge funds embraced quantitative trading as a strategy? So when it, there are two things when it comes to investing. There's the idea of what to buy or sell, mm -hmm. and there's how to buy or sell, what we call execution. When it comes to execution, Pretty much everybody has embraced quantitative financing. Where to allocate, break, how to break up the trade so it doesn't move prices around. When it comes to the idea, the genesis of the thesis, what to buy, not everyone has embraced it. Not everyone should embrace it. Even the Renaissance people believe in man plus machine kind of thing, or more machine plus man. So what do <laughs> quants Some actually Darth Vader do? Trading? Well, they do a more precise academic version of what we all do in this green, flat, Amex card shaped world of finance. They speculate. They gamble. They try as hard as Sheesh. they can to turn uncertainties into certainties, all in the glorious name of getting the bag. These robots just do it with higher IQs, better degrees, and more advanced tools than the rest of us. Quants, believe it or not, your people too. And I'm sorry for ever so, judging. So XQC is kind of a quant in a way. In a way, maybe the greatest quant. Thank you. For good work, I'm Dan Toomey. That's what the Q is for? <laughs> He's X quantitative C. That's his name. Surely this world of quants wasn't beyond the grasp of a man like myself. So I had one of my anon quants engage in a role-playing exercise where I pretended to be them and they pretended to be a higher up at an elite quant trading firm. Somehow, this wasn't sexual. Hey Dan, um, mm -hmm. the Ultima for uh, PLTR is a little bit lagging behind the, uh, you know, the polynomial fit we ran the GBU on. Do you have any idea of how we could, you know, better implement like a decay skewed black shoals on this or something? I think there's um, some sort of like stochastic drift I'm not catching in my model. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can look at that. <laughs> Easy. He's in. You know that's how SBF answered, and he got a job at Jane Street. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of today's stream. Thank you for watching. We're going to raid. We're going to raid. Link is seven. Give him some love. Give him some love. Um... Gotta, gotta work, gotta work, gotta work, gotta work. Be back tomorrow. But I'm so far on a streak. Right? So good. Uh, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Link is watching house. Bye.